Gas fitter exam cram session video 30. Okay, there's an exception to everything. So we already established that up to over half a PSI, or we can just say up to five PSI, because we know what happens with half a PSI. Up to half a PSI, you can have a four inch fitting. Five PSI, you gotta weld your four inch fitting. Over five PSI, everything gets welded. But there's an exception. There's always exceptions. There's always a but. But you got a Scotch Marine boiler, a huge Scotch Marine boiler. It comes as a package. So the gas train, that gas train comes with it because it's going to need regulators and valves and solenoids and all of this stuff specifically calibrated for that unit. And you're looking at it and it's like, it's all threaded and it's six inch. We can't have a six inch threader fitting. No, we can't, except if it comes as part of the package on a boiler. So that's the time when you can have larger fittings on the gas train. All welded piping shall be subject to special inspection. Yes, um, that's like one of the hardest welding qualifications. Okay, um, when you're going for your qualification for gas pipe welding, um, it's low hydrogen rod, you're doing your root bead, uh, 6010, 6011, and then you do the filler and the crown, you're doing that in a 7018, a low hydrogen rod. That takes a lot of skill to not have slight inclusions or any imperfections. And how do they know? You're going to x-ray that. And the little imperfections will show up just like those little black spots on smoker's lungs. You know, and then, you know you, you've been smoking all your life and now you're coughing up a lot of stuff. You're going to say, uh-oh, the spot's right there. That black spot, that's the cancer. Well, on the weld, the black spot, that's a fail. Okay, um, they can also cut the pipe into four sections, uh, longitudinally, lengthwise, and then they'll take that and they'll, uh, they'll bend it to see if the weld cracks at the bend. But yes, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, one of the harder tests. And this is not going to be on the exam, but when they test, like, you know, you have several different tests, you know, for, for welding. Um, for pipe, you know, there are some tests where you're going to just weld horizontally. Or you're going to do just a straight vertical weld, okay? For the gas welding uh, certification, you're going to do it at a 45 degree, okay? That's that certification. Not easy. Not easy because it's got to be pretty also. You can't, you know, it's like now you're dealing with gravity and weird positions and the weld's got to look beautiful. It's got to look like, you know, you, you were welding and someone was turning the pipe for you so you only had to work on the top. Of course it's going to look beautiful, you know. No, and vertical, well, you have, you're going to maintain the same speed and deposit all the way around because it's a uniform fight against gravity. Here, not so. Your fight against gravity is going to change depending on where you're going around. Okay, so, not on a test, it's just interesting. Um, in addition, welding pipe, welded piping four inches or larger operating at a pressure over five psi shall be butt welded and radiographed, radiographed x-rays. This is information that you will be asked. Okay. Didn't really have a lot of welding questions in the practice questions, so here when we hit the welding, we are gonna spend some time on it because they do touch upon welding and sometimes they ask some weird questions. We'll go over all of that, but let's start getting this under our belt because you can have many different types of welds. You can join your metal depending on how you set up the joint, how you fill it. Um, and here we're going to always assume we're just stick welding. Okay? You can also TIG weld, but that's more for stainless steel. 
You know, um, we're going to say stick welding. That's generally how you do it with uh, steel piping. So, in addition, welded piping four inches or larger. So, welded four inches and up. Operating pressures over five psi. So, in the limit of uh, where we said that over 5 psi everything is welded because it's that critical well in a system over psi on four inches larger fittings shall be butt welded so everything gets butt welded okay four inches or larger in the system where everything is welded so in a five psi uh, over five psi system Four inches or larger butt welded. Now, when you butt weld, not on the test, but if you, the more you un, the more you see this, because if you're not familiar with pipe welding, then some this stuff will sound like just a bunch of information. But when you butt weld, what they're saying is you're bringing the two ends of the pipe together and you know the welder he's gonna he's gonna take his grinder and he's gonna give it an angle okay he's gonna give it a, cha a, a chamfer or an angle such that now he takes his 6010 for the root pass here where he left just a little bit of flat he's gonna hit it with the 6010 6010 burns nice and hot this is going to burn that root pass very well and now gives him a solid foundation to start the weld. These faces here for the root are so thin, so tiny that he's not, you know, that it's not uh, the biggest portion of the weld because what we really want is a high, a high quality low hydrogen. Low hydrogen is going to translate to less impurities, less inclusions. That's the main body to weld. But here, because the 6010 is going to be a little easier, hotter, going to make sure we really burn in there. We start with the root pass as a 6010. Then we're going to fill. So the 7018, the low hydrogen rod, um, all the 70s are low hydrogen. Um, the first two numbers, they kind of tell you the family of rods. So the, the 60s, they burn hot. The 70s, low hydrogen. You're going to have the fill, the fill pass. This is going to provide the main body of the weld. It's going to fill this big area here. And then you'll have your cover pass. The cover pass is kind of like a reinforcement. And that's where you get to see just how good the welder is. If, he, if he's good, his little ripples, it should look like a, a little stack of coins. You got a stack of coins and you, you lay them flat and it's just a nice uniform, you know, a semicircle upon semicircle. It's supposed to be very pretty. Okay, I remember uh, helping welders who like, some of them were like absolute artisans. Like, you'll have spatter and everything. He would take his file and he would file right at the edges of the root you know get all that spatter off shiny shine this up gorgeous gorgeous work you know and never fail the x-ray so why the four inch okay when we're hitting this root pass you see that we want complete penetration we want all this metal melting together into a nice solid foundation but if you notice now we're entering into the ID the inside dimension of the pipe so if we took a cross-sectional look we're going to see that when we start you know the, the butt joint is in there somewhere when we start you wouldn't be able to know well where's the joint itself unless you shine a flashlight or whatever but now when you do the root pass all of a sudden there is going to be a little bit of, of obstruction. 
you know, and for sizes four inch and larger, they're willing to accept that obstruction. You know, Dakota is very picky about you're going to ream your pipe. Who reams their pipe, right? That's the that's the tool that's always the shiniest because it never gets used. You know, nobody reams the pipe, but you're supposed to because that little obstruction causes turbulence and premature wear of the pipe. When you're welding, that root pass is going to stick out a little bit into the inside dimension, but it's accepted for sizes four inches larger. When you go with smaller pipes, you can imagine, yeah, that, that little obstruction, now that might be an issue. So for that, you have other types of joints to use. But for now, over 5 PSI, 4 inches or larger, butt welded. That's what they mean by butt welded. This is the examination you're going to take with the pipe on a 45 and 6010 for the root, 7018 for the fill in the cover. Okay? No inclusions, no select. The x ray will see even the tiniest little speck. So, 7018 requires a lot of skill to get it hot, get the fill, not overfill too much, and have pure, clean metal all the way through. Okay, now this is the code in plain English. We're on page 61, right in the middle. So, here I take the advantage because you're not going to see it like this in the actual code. Here I take the advantage to really let you see some important things. This, this, you, you got to know it. You got to know it like the back of your hand because you will be asked and this is where you start and then work your way to the other pressures. Threaded piping may only be used up to four inch and at pressures no greater than half a PSI. We've been, we've been repeating it over and over again and we just repeated it again. Threaded piping may only be used up to four inches at pressures no greater than half a PSI. So we said, you know, buildings are not going to have more than half a PSI, with exceptions. Here, half those half PSI systems, the largest threaded fitting you're ever going to be able to use is a four inch fitting. Okay? Materials not specified by the code shall require investigation, testing, recommendation by the manufacturer, and approval from the commissioner. Uh, blanket rule whenever you're going through the code, whatever the code book, uh, you know, the code book itself, when they say commissioner, it's the commissioner of buildings. Okay? So, materials that, you know, you don't see in the code, the two reasons for that. One of them is, well, you're not allowed to use them. Or the other reason is, well, you would need to have them approved first and then you can use them. So, you can take that up with the, uh, with the commissioner. After you've uh, done the research to have it investigated, tested, uh, recommendation from the manufacturer. The following piping material shall not be used. This is uh, let's see, this is worth writing down. Right. Now, first off, we are definitely using carbon steel and wrought iron. In fact, that's pretty much all we're using. That's pretty much all we're used to using. Black steel. Wrought iron, again, I said you can use it, but it doesn't... It, practically doesn't exist okay what you cannot use okay you cannot use cast iron you cannot use copper brass aluminum And you cannot use metallic tubing, five. Metallic tubing. Okay. All right. Here we have uh, an abbreviation, CSST. What does that stand for? Corrugated stainless steel tubing.
tubing. Okay. I know what you're going to say because I say it also, and that's just how the code is because there's always an exception. But you do realize the flexible connector to the stove is corrugated stainless steel tubing painted yellow. All right. So, but the blanket statement is we're not using that. Okay. Now, I want to take a moment here to go over um, flashcards. You're using flashcards, I hope. I highly recommend using flashcards. I went over like generally how you're going to make your three piles, the easy, medium, hard. Easy, you're not gonna spend time on that, you know, except maybe review them once a week, every two weeks, a month, but you're not gonna give it any more time than it deserves because it's easy. Middle pile, that's the one you spend most of your time with. Take to work, whatever, you keep going through them till they become easy. Hard. When you feel you're ready, start looking at the hard ones and go through them and see like, well, a lot of them are still hard, but wait a minute, I think this one, I think I know how to solve. And you start chipping away at the hard and eventually you'll conquer those also. They go in the medium and then medium goes into the easy. How to write up your flashcards. For information like this, like when I got a list of stuff I cannot use, and I need to memorize all of them because, you know, you don't know how you're going to get asked this question and how many, you know, what's the answer choices are. You need to know all of them. What I like to do on the flashcard is, because it helps when you're trying to memorize, because it gives your mind structure, a frame to work within. It organizes it in your mind and it saves, it, it helps your mind, saves your mind an extra step because if you don't organize it, your brain's going to have to organize it. And the less organized, the more organizing you do before putting it in your head, the more work you save your brain, it'll, you know, shave those uh, neurons. It'll make those pathways shorter a lot faster. Okay. So here for the card, let's say this is the front of my flash card. And, you know, we'll say. No good materials, all right? You'll write out a sentence, but this is the one saying, what are the materials that are no good, NG, no good in a uh, gas piping system? Now here, I'm gonna put down, because I have what? One, two, three, four, five. I have five items, right? So I'm gonna put that blah, 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 blah. And notice I numbered these. You could put the numbers here if you want, on the back or not. But more importantly, to help me remember when I'm thinking like, uh-oh, there's a list. What I do is, on the front, I say five items. This way now, when I'm looking at the card and it says, what materials are not allowed? And then it says five items. I know, before I turn the card over, you know, and I'm not ashamed to use my hands, they're great counting instruments, I got to have five fingers up before I turn the card over, or at least try to have five fingers up, and see if I matched it. This helps a lot in memory, memorizing lists of material, okay? Now I'm going to do you one more, or I'm going to do your brain one more in that this already starts organizing it because it gives you a frame. It gives you some kind of parameter for your brain to say, well, what kind of information we're dealing with, a body of information. Now, we can organize this even more before it goes into our brain to make our brain's life easier in that, okay, cast iron, iron is iron, okay. Aluminum, aluminum is, is aluminum. Metallic tubing is a little weird, but so, you know, we can keep it to itself. Corrugated stainless steel tubing, but Instead of memorizing five items, what I like to do wherever I can, where I'm sure it's going to help me and it's not going to be a pain, pain or make it more complicated, where it's actually going to do something for me, I will actually organize something that's easy for me, almost instinctive to group together. And to me, copper and brass can be put in the same thing. I mean, brass is, a, is an alloy of copper. You're working with copper, 
right? You're soldering stuff or you're, you're, uh, you're pro-fitting stuff, you're, press, you're pro-pressing stuff. A lot of times it's like certain things or if, you're, if you need adapters to go from copper to a different uh, system or material, it's going to be in brass. So to me, copper and brass, they go together. They're hand in hand. It's like I can put them in my head as for this particular instance, it's, it's almost the same thing to me. So now it's just four items. And that helps me remember even more because now aluminum is definitely not copper or iron. I mean, these three metals are in different families. If we try to join them together, we got to do something special. Whereas copper and brass, you don't have to do that much work to get copper and brass to work with each other. So I say they're in the same family. So now, instead of five items, I got four items. I already made my brain's life easier. See, and now it's just four items. So I just streamlined my flashcard, and now, since I did some work already for my brain, when I look at the flashcard, my brain can uh, get this accomplished faster, you know, and time, time is something we are considering. I mean, we don't want to spend a lot more time. I, I did recommend to you, to you that two months, I think two months, guys, one a month, I, I really think two months, but by that same token, Three months is too much time to spend on this. This, this is, three months is a lot, you know. I don't think three months is actually good. I think I, I, three months is actually going to be counterproductive. I think after three months, you're going to destroy some of the good work you did. I think two months is, per, is perfect. You know, so, you know, we're still going to make flashcards and learn all our stuff, you know, but there's no reason why... We can't streamline it a little bit. I think this flash card is four items. Okay. And you know your brain works, you know, like I said, your brain lets you think. Your waking self, your conscious self, the self you think makes all the decisions. Your brain lets you think that, you know, just like, you know, you, you, give, the, the, you give the kid, you know, you say, go play. You know, because you got better, you got stuff to do and you don't need your kid on the foot. You know, go play or do this or whatever. Or uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, your brain does the same thing to you. Compared to some of the amazing higher functions that are going on in your head. You know, to your waking self, your conscious self. Your brain actually kind of thinks you're a child. Okay. Some of the stuff it does, it does not need you getting on the foot. And one of them is organizing and streamlining your memory. Um, case in point, learning a language. Don't use this as an excuse to slack off, but you know, if you're gonna learn another language, you gotta practice, you gotta stick to it. But okay, sometimes you slack off, this or this or that. Believe it or not though, even when you slacked off and you're not keeping up and you took a break, you know, a couple weeks here and there, you're still learning a language. You're learning it while you're awake. You're learning it while you're asleep. Your brain is actually working on the pathways in your memory, uh, connecting them sufficiently to uh, your voice center, your speech centers or whatever. You're actually still learning the language. That doesn't mean you're gonna, you, you know, you don't have to do anything. It's just that, no, there are so, there's so many other steps and levels to learning something, to acquiring a skill that you would be amazed. And these little things here, it's like, it makes a difference when you're trying to learn. It really, you, you'll start feeling, you know, it's like, you wake up one morning and it's like, oh, wow, I just, I just know that, you know? Just, just yesterday or the day before, it was like, I kept struggling. It's like, oh, so I know. It's like, yeah, because, you know, you, you know, when your brain said go out and play, you know, or, you know, go watch cartoons, while you were doing that, your brain was doing all the smart stuff, the real stuff, you know? Okay, um, carbon, steel, and wrought iron piping shall be at least standard weight. 
Notice they don't want to say Schedule 40. They just say Standard Width. Well, what's the standard? The standard is Schedule 40. Pipe and fitting shall, this is page 62, pipe and fitting shall be clear and free from cutting burrs and defects both in structure and from threading. Highlighted burrs because, I know, I know you know, but I want to make sure that, you know, on the test and stress or whatever, you don't think that, well, we don't, we never really, we never really ream. And it's like, well, that doesn't mean we're not supposed to, okay? This test is a code test. We ream. We ream the pipe, no burrs. Uh, be thoroughly brushed so all the rust and scale and crap is off. And have all chip and scale blown out. Okay. Um, this is not on the test, but since we're here, you know, we might as well touch upon OSHA and safety. Uh, it's not safety first, it's safety always. So, blown out. How are we going to blow this up? Compressed air. We know we cannot use compressed air at a pressure higher than 30 psi. Okay, we're not allowed to use compressed air higher than 30 psi. And although we can chip, we can blow out the chip and scale, we do not clean ourselves. Although it's so it's so easy and convenient, but OSHA says we do not clean ourselves with compressed air. You know, blowing all the stuff off our body because. It's possible that little tiny fragments, little bits of metal, whatever, the pressure from the nozzle is going to shoot it deep under your skin. You won't even notice it, but it'll be in there and it'll slowly and surely get infected and cause issues and stuff. And you don't notice it. And by the time you do notice it, it's big and could be an issue. So no compressed air. Oh, no, do not use compressed air like in situations like this because we're blowing out the chip and scale at a pressure higher than 30 psi and we never clean ourselves off with compressed air not on a test this I figured doesn't hurt safe um not safety first it's safety always defects in pipe and fitting shall not be repaired such material shall be replaced yeah there, there's no it's not up for debate you know throw it away where in contact with corrosive material, atmosphere metallic piping shall be coated. Okay, so corrosive material, atmosphere, uh, someplace humid, uh, cinderfill, cement pores, stuff like this. Co contact with cement or could come in contact with uh, water, carry, you know, water around the cement and of course that frees up the lime and that stuff starts eating away the pipe. Coatings and lining shall not be considered as adding strength. Yes, the pipe is the pipe. It's it has a certain strength rating. You know, if you if you coat it in tar or plastic or whatever, that's just to protect it. That's not to strengthen it. Okay. Thread shall be tapered. Okay. So IPS threads. Uh, NPT threads. Um, Technically, you know, uh, people like to say uh, national pipe thread, but actually NPT is an acronym and the uh, letters are actually code letters for particular, uh, particular uh, qualifications or designations. So NPT threads, IPS threads, um, N, N really stands for it's a national standard or an American thread, you know. Um, pipe with threads that are stripped, chipped, corroded, or otherwise damaged shall not be used. Yes, yeah, so when your drop head keeps giving you ragged, ragged threads or whatever, get a different drop head. It's unacceptable. The threads got to be clean, neat, sharp. Almost like the threads you get when you're getting your piping delivered. So, um, where a manufacturer's weld opens during cutting or threading, that portion of the pipe shall not be used. Yes, pipe starts off as plate, it gets rounded, and then 
uh, submerged metal arc just runs down the length of it welding that seam sometimes it can come apart or sometimes it welds funny 